Hello and welcome inside the WOSN studios. It's time for another edition of Press Row. And we're joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Todd, you were in Middletown for week one. Yes. Aaron was at Elida. Mark and I were all over the place. We got our week one fix in the books and we've got a lot to talk about because there were some major surprises. What would you say is the biggest surprise from week one high school football? I would say to me, the biggest surprise was the Kenton Wildcats being shut out which that's a historical feat. The last time Ken had been shut out was the end of the 2006 season. I think it was a 95-game streak. Coldwater, I don't think it was a surprise that Coldwater won. I don't think it was a surprise that Coldwater won easily. But anytime you shut out a Kenton team, and it might be a young Kenton team, but it's still a Kenton team. Anytime you shut out a Kenton team, that's going to raise some eyebrows. That, to me, was, was the biggest eyebrow raiser last week. That was uh, one that I certainly thought was a surprise, but, you know, Kenton's quarterback's in Missouri, so yeah. what are you going to do? Uh, I thought the other one was uh, Elida LCC because uh, I'm not sure if Elida's really very good or LCC's really very bad. Uh, I did not expect a 38-point spread. Uh, to me, that was a complete mystery. I, I don't know what we're looking at there. Uh, obviously, week two will provide some clarification on everything, but uh, the fact that Elida blew out Lima Central Catholic really surprised me. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that Elida would win the game, but uh, as good as the T-Bird program has been for a decade plus, it was uh, almost unfathomable they would lay down and let the Bulldogs roll them by 38. That one stuck out to me. 522 to 161 was the total offensive numbers from that game, Todd. 25 first downs for Elida to just six mm. for LCC. Mm. 400 of the 522 coming on the ground for Elida. And I would say that was partially one of my surprises just because of the, you know, the difference in score, the 52-14 with the 38-point difference there, that being a little surprising. Also, I would say a little bit of a surprise was the closeness of the Marion local Macomb game up at Macomb week one. And, you know, Macomb's one of those teams you can never sleep on in the Blanchard Valley Conference. Chris Algie, in my opinion, one of the most underrated coaches in the state. And he always has his teams ready to play. And don't know if it's just, you know, Marion Local maybe just resting on their laurels for that huge matchup with Bealsville this week that they've got <laughs> or what it was. Or, you know, having to be in a bus and come from Maria Stein to Macomb and go up I-75 and, you know, do quite a bit of traveling this week or last week rather. But uh, that game ended up a lot closer than I thought it would be. But However... Uh, Yes. Macomb did score with two seconds left and got a two-point conversion to make it a little bit closer than what it should have been. It was an extremely sloppy game, a lot of turnovers, a lot of penalties. So it wasn't quite a two-point game, although I think you're right, which it might have been closer than some people thought between Maryland yes. and Macomb. Yeah. That's a different team than last year. That was their yeah. first time getting a go as this unit, and Tim Goodwin will mold those guys. I'm sure they'll get better as the season goes along, but that was a scare for them. How about Allen East, though? over Van Buren. I, they were impressive and we talked about them last week a little bit. They looked really good and they could make some noise in the NWC, I think. Well, the, on the other side of that, NWC goes seven and one. I don't know yeah. that anybody had that as a real high possibility. That was a bit of a surprise too and a pleasant surprise. And that's the stuff that helps you come week 11. You get those extra non-league points. Uh, WBL had a pretty good week at seven and three. Mac was seven and three, but NWC, that 7-1 record bodes well for that conference, and I think that could feed into one of our questions later. But looks like in the NWC, other than Paulding, I don't know that there's really a gimme in the conference. I still think it's Jefferson's to lose. They were impressive, Todd. You got to see mm -hmm. them on Friday night. You did double duty last weekend. That's right. Yeah. And uh, you did a very impressive win for uh, Jefferson over uh, Shawnee's team that's in rebuild mode with a new coaching staff and new philosophies in place there. But uh, I still think when it comes down to it, it's going to be Jefferson and Spencerville at the top. And if you thought maybe Ada was just going to roll over and die, obviously that's not going to be the case with this offense putting up 69 points and Seth Conley throwing for eight, not nine, touchdowns uh, against USV in week one. Well, Ada plays Arlington in week two. That's a game we'll have on the West Ohio Sports Network for you on Saturday. Jefferson plays Coldwater. And to me, I think that's the most intriguing week two matchup. You guys agree or you have something better? Oh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. As Aaron mentioned, we had Jefferson and Shawnee on WIMA last week. And as Jefferson was rolling in that game, I knew they, the thing that was impressive is that I don't care what they said, you know they were looking ahead to week two and playing Coldwater. And they still took care of business against Shawnee. Uh, I don't think Jefferson's past defense was up to snuff. That could really hurt him against Coldwater. But to me, that's the game with the most meaning in week two. 
other than uh, in the WBL, I think Bath at OG tops the list of an interesting opening week for league play because Bath is coming off that huge one over St. John's. Now, is St. John's really down or did Bath just really catch them at a bad time or are the Wildcats for real? We'll know uh, after their OG game. I, I think just about the entire slate of the Western Buckeye League mm -hmm. is some interesting matchups. I look at Defiance traveling to Kenton. The one extreme of the Western Buckeye League, the far northwest corner all the way to the far eastern side of the WBL. So it's a long bus trip to Defiance, who finally ended their losing streak with the win over Napoleon. And we already mentioned Kenton's struggles last week at Coldwater. I, I, I'd be interested to see how much Defiance's win last week against Napoleon, if that was truly a, a step forward for Defiance, or if that was more just Defiance really playing a good game because it was their arch rival Napoleon. Because oftentimes in years past, that defiance Napoleon winner, it's usually a pretty good harbinger to the type of season that winner's going to have. So uh, that's the thing I'm looking forward to in the WBL this week. Well, since we're talking WBL, I'm going to throw the two other games that I had besides Jefferson and Coldwater. First one being Van Wert St. Mary's. Yeah. And you and Mark Miller talked about it last night on Mark's Madness. You know, is, is Van Wert you know, a sleeper? No longer anymore. I mean, everybody knows about them. They had three pick sixes last Friday night against Bryan. And does that defense continue against the Rock'em Sock'em wrecking ball offense? Do you that really Doug think Fry... St. Mary's is going to throw the ball <laughs> yeah. three times? Maybe they they threw the ball in the first play against Sydney. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I heard that. But I don't know if they'll throw it three times. I don't know if they'll get three pick sixes. But I like this matchup of two hard nosed, gritty football teams. Yeah. And I also like to see, based on what I saw last Friday night out of Elida, how do they match up with Salina? Salina runs the exact same systems that LCC runs offensively and defensively. So basically, the Elida Bulldogs have been practicing against this exact same system that Salina runs for weeks and even going back into when they were having scrimmages in preparation for LCC in week one at Elida. I'll tell you what though, I'm really, really intrigued on that matchup just to see if Elida riding that high over the huge win over LCC last Friday night against Salina, can they maintain positive momentum? And just a round of the WBL, it'll be interesting to see how Shawnee bounces back from that tough yes. loss against Jefferson with Wapakoneta, one of the big rivals, and one of the favorites in the WBL coming into Shawnee on Friday night. Yeah, another game that intrigues me, even though both teams laid huge eggs in week one, is LCC St. John's. Yeah. Two a proud game on programs. WOSN next uh, Saturday night. Exactly right. Two proud programs. You got to believe both of them are going to step it up a little bit from week one. That could be a real knockout kind of game. And the loser is going to be 0 and 2, and that's hard to recover from. You're, you're saying LCC and St. John's are going to be excited to play each other? And, and then there's that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, going 0 and 1, you learn a lot week one, of course. But then you, I feel like you learn even learn more, more week two yeah. because not, now we have something to go off of. And going to 0 and 2, that's a big deal in a 10 week season. So you touched on it a little before, Todd. We're around here, we're used to the MAC being the best conference in the area. Top to bottom, do you think that still holds true this season from what we've seen so far? I'm not sure. I, I think I Todd really hit on it. With, with the NWC, I think one through seven, the NWC is very strong. The MAC, you, you certainly got questions at the bottom of the MAC. You look at New Bremen, obviously, there's going to be questions there and some of the other MAC schools. The top of the MAC, obviously, I think is still the best in the area. But top to bottom, I think the NWC is certainly in the discussion. And I think the Western Buckeye League is going to be pretty strong one through eight as well. I think on any given day you could go 1A, 1B with the MAC and Northwest Conference, and that's how I looked at it posing this question. I also think the WBL could be wide open, but this week we're going to get a lot more clarity, especially Bath, you know, especially Elida Salina, especially Van Wert St. Mary's. And can, you know, Walpock Shawnee, can Shawnee improve from a week ago? They're not going to be the favorites in this game. We all know that. But can they improve week one to week two? Can they make positive strides to give themselves fighting chances in week three, week four, and so on and so forth? What about the track after one week? You know, we, we always hear about the track being one of the best conferences in the state. It's a bigger conference, obviously. You've got Toledo Central Catholic. You've got uh, Lima Senior. You've got Finley, who had some impressive wins last week. Do, do we think the track is going to be living up? Will the track live up to that reputation this year? Is the bottom of the track going to bring it down? Well, St. Francis was really bad last year, yep. and you, you got to hope they're better. And uh, Pickwell beat St. John's last week. Yeah, and uh, you know St. John's has lost. been okay, but not great. That was a national game on television. Yeah, yeah. Toledo Central Catholic uh, played a very, very yeah. strong team. They lost Benedict. Yeah, Benedictine yeah. D four defending state champ. You got the D three state champ. You know that's that's no no slouch going into that one. Yeah, I, th I think the track is uh, pretty good top to bottom, and e even a bad team there. Even St. Francis last year had a running back that could run for 9,000 yards. Yeah. I mean, if you Carswell slept on them, you know, they could jump up and beat you. So 
Uh, I think that league is still very, very good. I'm just intrigued with the Northwest Conference because I'm hopeful that it's about time that uh, Bluffton and Allen East wake up from the doldrums mm -hmm. of a decade plus now, basically, of mediocre football. Maybe they can finally get back up to the top of the NWC. We know Spencerville and Jefferson are going to be solid. Columbus Grove's going to figure in this thing. You could have a legitimate five-team deal there to say we could win this conference. I, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, you get the feeling that conference is going to come down to the last league game of the season like like it did last year. Like Spencerville Jefferson? It yeah. could be. <laughs> it, could. it could be some well, other teams. Too. The other thing, too, is look at how the schedule is now for the Northwest Conference yeah. yes. compared four to years past. 10, it's right. now weeks four through ten. Weeks one through three are that non-conference. And, you know, we, I mentioned Ada a little bit ago. You know, I'm going to yeah. see them next week when they take on LCC, but how do they respond this week and then moving forward as well? If they keep, hey, if they put up 60 points in each of those three games, which could very easily be done with this offense that they run, you know, don't be sleeping on them, Northwest Conference. That's another team that could be right in there amongst the talk too. All right, let's graduate from high school to college. Bowling Green opening up this season this Saturday at Tennessee. In Tennessee. In it's at a neutral field. Uh, it, it neutral field. Right. Yeah. We're, in we're playing in Nashville though, so do they have a chance against Tennessee and the Wolf Brothers, I guess. Well, sure they have a chance. They're not playing Alabama. They're playing Tennessee. But, but they're the SEC, and everything in the SEC is awesome. They, believe get, me, get Tennessee. A, get a shot of this. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> my shirt tells yeah. you that I think they have a chance. Tennessee has got a lot of young talent. I mean, mm -hmm. Butch Jones has hit the recruiting trail, and if we graded this game on recruiting rankings, we wouldn't even make the trip to Nashville. But, of course, we don't. Uh, they are supremely talented. Ethan Wolf uh, from Minster that uh, you were referring to is back as their starting tight end. They have had a few key injuries and suspensions. Uh, they're also youthful throughout their lineup. So I think Bowling Green has a puncher's chance with the offense BG is going to put out there. They're going to be able to put up some points. Their defense is a huge question mark. And uh, Tennessee, uh, you would imagine, will be able to run the ball with Jalen Hurd, who uh, looks like a tight end playing running back. But you know, first game of the year, I've always said in college football is the prime upset week. You can catch a team unprepared for various reasons, and it's a neutral site. It's still in Tennessee. It'll still be packed with Vols fans at Nissan Stadium, but it's not in Knoxville, so that's also a bit of a help. And, I, you know, they have a fighter's chance, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, I mean, one thing with college football is you don't have a preseason game, so you don't know exactly. what you have until you have it. Let me twist this a little bit, Todd, and ask you this. This will be Dino Baber's second season opener for Bowling Green. Right. Will he have a third season opener at Bowling Green? Well, his name is getting bandied about. Quite and a bit. The interesting thing with that, too, is a lot of that's based on we figure there are going to be a lot of openings. We already have Tim Beckman shown the door. There's rampant speculation that there will be other jobs in this part of the country open, and he would certainly get mentioned with those. Uh, I would suggest to you. One state closer. Yeah, one state closer. If Possible two there. If they go anywhere, if they win any of their four preseason games, which they got two Big Ten teams plus Tennessee and Memphis, if somehow Bowling Green wins a couple of those and then rolls through the MAC and puts up huge offensive numbers with their whole offense back from last year, figures they will, then certainly he could be gone after this year. I think one of the things, too, talking about BG as well, is if Matt Johnson can stay healthy. I mean, Ben Kanapke did a great job last year coming in and, you know, running this offense. But, you know, Matt Johnson was the man last year going into this. You know, there was all the hype around him and what he could do. And this is the type of offense he could grow and excel at, as you know, Todd. If he can stay healthy and not get hurt in this game like he did last year against Western Kentucky in the opener, I think they've got a, a great chance against Tennessee. The offense is prolific as it is, as fast as it is. And, you know, Tennessee's going to try and play fast, too. We know that also. So, I mean, it could turn in defenses are both suspect. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, obviously, pulling for the Falcons uh, for that one. And you can listen to uh, Todd's call on Sports Talk 940 WCIT Saturday afternoon. A, a little local connection. Taylor Royster, yes. uh, the Lima Central Catholic grad, has moved from inside to D end for Bowling Green defensively. Yes. Hope they're hoping his quickness mm -hmm. will get him some pressures on the quarterback. So senior year for Taylor, uh, keep an eye on number 33. So college football is back and we've got games on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, on Monday, on Tuesday. We got games Sunday too. Isn't Sunday. It? Sunday yeah. I forgot Sunday. So we've got games pretty much every day of the week. Have we oversaturated the market or is this acceptable and encouraged. It's acceptable and encouraged this time of year because <laughs> it leads into 
the NFL with week one. I mean, I know, I know you guys are all going to be on the road this weekend in various parts of the country with, uh, with college football, but this guy right here is not going to be on the road. You got the remote? I've got the yeah. weekend off. Yeah. I, don't have to go, I don't have to work on Saturday. I don't have to work on Sunday. I don't have to work on Monday. I got the remote. I've got my big glass of water. I've got the radio. I got the television. Life is good. Obviously, they wouldn't have Sunday games after this week, yeah, right. so that's an aberration. But and this is a, every year at this time they right. do that Sunday game yeah. leading into Labor Day. And you know, I, if the American way, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Is it? <laughs> yes. Have we reached saturation? Sure, but we're going to keep pouring water on there because it's college football, it's television. They need product. They have product. Let's do this. Yeah, it's something for everyone. The thing I love about the NFL is that it's well now it's three days a week, but it used to be you know Sunday Monday. And then you really look forward to it all week. And then when, you, when it arrives, it's worth it. But now I'm fearing with, I guess if you have your favorite team with college football, it doesn't matter. That's still once a week. But anyway, it's a good way to, to start, the, start the season. And we're jumping right in with college football. And of course, high school football will have you covered all week long here on the radio and on television for week two. That's going to do it for this edition of Press Row. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy your games. We'll see you out there.